eerily haunting true stories about remote abandoned locations rich in history. Come with us and our travels from state to state, if you dare. <laughs> Maybe the last time anybody sees us alive. I don't know where she has a fucking Hello? Gina, there is a beehive over there. Do you see that in the hole? Buckle up, buttercup. Welcome to 50 States of Madness. Welcome to 50 States of Madness. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Good. I always give away what time we're um, I know. recording. I'm like, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. So, obviously, it's the evening. It's the and evening. I'm doing great. Yeah, it's My like name is Shannon. Oh, I'm Gina. We haven't done that for a while either. I know. Well, just once in a while, you know, just introduce us. <laughs> I don't think people care, but, I you know. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I think by now they probably are able to tell us apart. I don't know. Yeah. But for those first timers here, welcome. Yeah, yeah. welcome. If you're brand new, welcome I know. to 50 States of Madness. Hope you love us. Yeah. It's a bumpy ride. I know. <laughs> We're all over the place. I'm going to give a little update because I know everybody's really worried about my spider bite. Oh, shit. I didn't even ask you. <laughs> I'm dying. No. Um, it's actually it's actually way better. Oh, good. Yeah. I have my timer set for my antibiotics because I'm so nervous about missing one. And one time oh. I did accidentally miss it. And I actually made myself wake up in the middle of the night to take the third one for the day because, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, because I'm just so nervous about, you know, getting a hole in my leg or something. So but it's it's getting better. It's in that phase of being itchy, but oh. I don't want to push on it because I'm afraid there's still poison in there and I can still get a coma and die. So <laughs> You can still get a coma and die. You know, you catch those well, you like catch a cold. A coma. You catch a coma. <laughs> I'm oh, so man. afraid I'm going to catch one. <laughs> But <laughs> I know it's um, my English skills and I in English is not a second language for me. Just, you know, reminding people out there. It is my first language, <laughs> you know. Um, and then I'm trying the beanie thing today. I know you've seen Gina in the beanie and she looks super cute with it. And I always look like you're carting me off for treatment or something. <laughs> I don't even know what it looks like. It's just, but um, I had to do it because my hair, I don't know if you guys caught the episode a couple <laughs> weeks ago where my hair, <laughs> I think it looks really cute. I curl it. I do everything to it. But because it's so fine, it looks like I have none. So it was like just everywhere and anywhere. And so I, today was going to be another one of those days. So I'm trying the beanie look. So I just said slap a beanie on it. I have an extra one. <laughs> Yeah, and um, don't look as cute, but you know what? Hey, we got this better than my hair and <laughs> the way it looked the other day. This is how I comb my hair. I just put a beanie on or a hat. Yeah, <laughs> You wear it well. I actually Googled. I mean, you have to like, <laughs> like earlier, I was looking rough. I mean, yeah. I'm looking rough <laughs> right now, but no, but man. Yeah. I actually Googled like, why do I look so ugly in a beanie? Like, and they were talking about. <laughs> face shapes and all this different stuff and hairstyles and I fell under all those categories so I just wish I would be like really cute like oh I see them all the time like they put on cute little hats and they go out in the snow and they look super cute and I always look like I'm sick and on death's bed when I put one on but you know hey <laughs> <laughs> so today we are working on we're going to be talking about the Spreckles Mansion yeah I don't know I I feel like it's a pretty uh, a pretty popular case. I don't I know. It's, very well um, yeah. it's one that is, I, I feel weird when I talk about this stuff. Like, it's like when I say like, oh, my favorite, ser my favorite serial killer. Yeah. Like, I feel like it's really weird to say that, that like, <laughs> this is one of my favorite cases. Maybe because it's so intriguing. There's like a lot of twists and turns and a lot of. Well, and it's a mystery. So unknown. You know? Yeah. There's it's still. a mystery. It's a. Uh, um, to me, it's an unsolved case. Still. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say, like, they shut on the, the book on yeah. it, but to me, it's just, um, it's There's a lot of questions. Yeah. So it's, so um, okay. it's been one that I've followed from the beginning and I've watched probably every episode of everything that has to do with this case. And, um, I have a hard time 
doing episodes on these because I feel like a lot of people out there have a lot of opinions and I don't want to um, say the wrong thing and, you know, because yeah. a lot of people are pretty good armchair detectives out there and they, they're very... Um, judgmental or kind of I feel like yeah I don't want to say the wrong thing and then they're (laughs) gonna come at us but um but I'm very curious um if anybody listening is well versed on this what your opinion is so please comment and and uh, let us know because I'm very curious yeah what what their take is on it yeah so okay well the Sprinkles Mansion is um a historical home i want to say that kind of sits on um in san diego Mm -hmm. in coronado it's at 1043 ocean boulevard in san diego and it's right on the ocean yeah and it's like huge (coughs) property it's gorgeous if you can google it look it up yeah it's like 27 rooms it's um, huge. Like 10 bedrooms, 11 bathrooms. When you look at the front of the house, it doesn't appear to be that large, but yeah. with all the property and it's just, yeah. it's massive. There's a guest house, which is like separate across the way. Like there's like a pool that separates it, but there's, and that guest house is like a whole home on it. It has a whole separate address. Yeah. That's, so, yeah. yeah. It's huge. The house was built in 1908 by the rich heir to a sugar company who also owned the Hotel Del Coronado. At one time, this famous hotel was the largest resort in the world. The Marilyn Monroe movie, Some Like It Hot, was filmed here. The Hotel Coronado is said to be extremely haunted. I really want to stay there. It's probably pretty pricey, I would imagine. (laughs) I think it's very expensive. I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't been out there yet. Yeah. Yeah. I have um, driven by it, taken a yeah. tour. Yeah, but, but I... Uh, staying there? Yeah, I don't know. It's haven't done that yet. Yeah, maybe we should put that on our list of things to do. to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Rebecca Zahau was born on March 15, 1979, and was an immigrant of Burma. Rebecca was one of six children and grew up very poor. It was said that Rebecca didn't have running water in the house she grew up in. She came to the United States in 2001. In 2002, Rebecca married a 36-year-old nursing student from Scottsdale, Arizona. In 2008, she started dating a millionaire pharmaceutical tycoon from Arizona named Jonah Shacknai. This is when she was still kind of married, but they were separated from her first husband. Yeah. So Shacknai was the CEO of Medicis. Medicis. Medicis, thank you. Pharmaceutical. (laughs) His position made him the ninth highest paid CEO in Arizona, earning $6.4 million in 2010. I can even imagine. Yeah. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Be Patreon, nice. start signing up. Maybe that's what my wish will be. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> um, in 2012, he sold his company for $2.6 billion. His company was one of one that brought the injectable filler restylane to the market Ooh, Mm -hmm. yeah so restylane yeah shack knight had been married twice previously his first marriage was to kimberly james with whom he had two children his second marriage was to dina romano and they had one son named max being that rebecca grew up so poor this new life she was living was the complete opposite of what she knew Most people would think that Rebecca was in this relationship for the money, especially with Jonah being almost twice her age. However, friends and family said that Rebecca and Jonah shared common interests, enjoyed each other's company, and were very much in love. Jonah said they had a very strong connection from their first date. After dating for a few years, Rebecca moved into the mansion. Jonah let her rearrange things to make her feel more at home and was trying to facilitate a relationship between Rebecca and his children. It was said that Shaq Nye's two older children were a little weary about the relationship their wealthy dad was having with this much younger, beautiful woman. I can see like where the, you know, the questions would come into play and stuff like, yeah. you know, is she just there for the money? Is she, mm-hmm. you know, I understand that. I mean, cause from the outside, I think that's maybe what it looked like. I don't know. Yeah. She had been working as an ophthalmic technician. It was said to have loved her job. In 2010, Rebecca quit her job 
And when I was watching like videos on that, it was a lot had to do with because she felt so close to his son and she wanted to take care of him yes. and help raise him. Right. Yes. Like, and that was a big thing for her. Like, I know a lot of people too are like, oh, who wouldn't want to quit their job and be taken care of and be able to spend their time in a mansion. But she was so passionate about her job. She yeah. really loved what she did. That was like her livelihood and she really, really enjoyed her job. So I feel like that was that was a big thing for her to quit her job. Yeah. It was a sacrifice. It was. To take care of him. So mm-hmm. it showed you how much she cared for him. For him. And plus growing up with siblings and stuff, mm-hmm. you're used to having that family unit. So yeah. maybe that's a little bit what she missed. But yeah. Okay. She stayed home and tried to build a relationship with Jonah's youngest son, Max, who lived at the mansion part time. By 2011, Rebecca and her and six-year-old Max had become close, and Rebecca would watch Max on occasion if Jonah had to work late or run errands. So she, like, kind of, like, invested in this life. Like, she was really... Um, yeah. I mean, it sounded nice. like they were trying to, uh, you know, like they said that he was trying to facilitate um, a relationship between him and his, and between her and his older two children, from his first marriage. But I think um, with this one, maybe I feel like she spent more time with Max. And so being younger, I think maybe it was easier for them to develop a relationship. Yes, absolutely. And I'm having a hot flash. Should I have that on camera? Well, you're you on camera, I right? Yeah, you can't. <laughs> I am. I'm having a hot flash. Hold on just a second. Let me get this off. Oh, my goodness. No hair. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Couldn't do it. I tried. Tried to look cute for the fans. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Sorry about that. I just, every once in a while I get like, you know, 51 years old. It's not pretty, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are going to get into the story and it is a little bit confusing. So I'll try to, I tried to put this together as best as I could to make it easy to follow. But, um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's just a lot of information. Yeah. So on Monday, July 11th, 2011, Rebecca's 13 year old, um, sister Zena was visiting from out of town and she was staying there at the mansion. Rebecca was in charge of watching Max for a few hours while Jonah went to the gym and they all had plans to later go to the zoo that afternoon. Rebecca said that her sister Zena was in the shower and she was in the bathroom. She turned away for just a second when the accident happened. When she came out, she saw Max, who had been riding his scooter around chasing their dog, had fallen over the second story balcony by the grand staircase. Max had tried to grab onto the chandelier as he fell over the balcony, but now the chandelier was laying next to Max at the bottom of the staircase. Zena heard Rebecca screaming and ran out to the landing and saw her cradling Max li- Max's lifeless body in her arms. As Zena searched for Rebecca's cell phone to call 911, Rebecca started administering CPR to Max. Zena, being in a state of panic, was fumbling her words, and the 911 operator was having a hard time understanding who it was that fell off the balcony. The first officer on the scene said that when he arrived, Rebecca told him that when she came out and found Max at the bottom of the stairs, he was still conscious and that he uttered one last final word and that was ocean. And that was the name of his dog. Um, That will be, that will like come into play later um, because there's a lot of controversy and back and forth about him still being conscious at that point or not. Oh, um, another officer claims that he overheard Rebecca telling Zena, Dina is going to kill me. And Dina is Max's biological mom. Uh, Rebecca called Jonah, who was at the gym. When he picked up the phone, Rebecca couldn't speak. And all he heard was all of the chaos going on in the house. He immediately went home. When he got there, he saw that he saw a fire truck there along with other emergency vehicles and then he saw his son laying on the ground near the front door, and the paramedics were working on him. They rushed him to Coronado Sharp Sharp Hospital. Um, He said that at the time, Max was not breathing. When they got him to the hospital, the nurses and doctors were working nonstop to try to get him resuscitated, and they finally were able to get a heartbeat. He was then taken for a CT scan, 
The hospital then contacted Rady Children's Hospital, and they sent a team of medical staff specializing in trauma to take over the case. They had a consultation that same night with the staff at the Children's Hospital, and they confirmed that Max's condition was very serious and that they would do the best to stabilize him. In order to keep his body from going into stress, they put him into a medically induced coma. They were unsure about what injuries they were dealing with, um, but they did know that Max had suffered brain damage. And so there's there's a lot of, um, I think there was a lot of unknowns at this point yeah, about what exactly his um, injuries were. And I think at this point, I don't think anybody realized how serious it was. They knew that he was hurt and he had a serious injury, but I don't think they knew how grave it was at this point that yeah. they're, you know, they assumed that he would have obstacles yeah. to overcome, but he would survive. Yeah. And they got back the heartbeat. He's, yes. Yeah. Um, it says that he had broken several facial bones and suffered a severe injury to his spinal cord. The spinal cord injury interfered with his heart rate and his breathing. During this time, Jonah and Max's mom, Dina, took turns staying with Max in his room. The whole family was hoping and praying that Max would come out of this. While all of this is going on, Rebecca was staying home, taking care of everything there was that she could possibly do, and also being there for Jonah. Jonah did not want Rebecca at the hospital for fear something would happen with Dina, Max's biological mom. It's understandable. I mean. Yeah. And I don't think they had a good relationship. Yeah. Um, I don't think they hated each other. But I think there was some tension there. Well, he was still with Dina when he met yes, Rebecca. They were, yes. They were both married, I believe. Separated, but still legally married. Um, but I think, I don't think Dina trusted her a whole lot. Yeah. Um, Anytime you have a step parent who comes in, it's hard. It's hard. It is. And, and you hope for the best. And I, I we've have, both been in that yes. situation. We're both have, in that situation, you know, regardless yeah. of how old or young our kids are. We both have um, it. I have the best step you parent have, uh, for yeah. my daughter. Like I could not have asked for a better stepmother. She is my co-mother, you know, and she helped raise my oldest. Yeah. You, it's, on the other hand, <laughs> yeah, maybe had a little bit of a different experience. Yeah, I had but, a different but, experience. <laughs> but, but it is. It's like you're trusting this other human being mm-hmm. to love your child as much as you love them. And if mm-hmm. something happens like this, regardless if it was intentional or non-intentional. I can't imagine the, being in Rebecca's position and having no. this happen. Like, it's... You know, I feel like you have more responsibility as a step parent to take care of this mm-hmm. child and make sure that they're mm-hmm. well take more than your own. Oh, absolutely. So no, absolutely, hundred yeah. percent. On July thirteenth, Rebecca's nude and bound body was found hanging from the front upstairs balcony of one of the bedrooms in the mansion. She had been gagged with a t-shirt. Her arms were tied behind her back with a rope. In, a v- in very intricate knots, and her feet were bound together. Shockingly, her death was ruled a suicide. Just hours before Rebecca died at approximately 12.50 a.m., she listened to a voicemail from Jonah telling her that Max was not going to make it. They felt like Rebecca might have blamed herself for Max's accident since she was the adult in charge at the time. They seemed to make sense. This seemed to make sense to everybody except for Rebecca's mom, sister, and her brother-in-law. They insist that Rebecca was murdered. They have now dedicated to their, their lives to proving this. Um, they believe that there are a lot of holes in the story that the police have never even touched on. Rebecca's sister, Mary, says that, that Rebecca loved Max more than anything and was absolutely devastated by what happened, but had come to terms with the fact that this was an accident and this was not her fault. Now, mind you, this was just two days after the accident. Um, And Rebecca didn't have children of her own. No. She quit her job to stay at home with Max. Mm -hmm. I, he, Jonah trusted her enough to watch the child while he ran errands. I mean, I feel like she was like the co caretaker in that home for this child. Right. And when you say that they, she was found bound and gagged, um, it's hard to believe that 
one uh, a female would take their life like that. Like it's just it's yeah. not very common yeah. um for a woman to hang themselves. Uh there's other ways that we tend to we as in females. Like you know, we tend well, it's to It's a vanity thing. Yeah, it's just and and for her to be nude. Nude, that's humiliation right there. Like who's nobody wants to be found that way. Found naked. And also um she had the rope tied around her neck with her hair under the rope. Mm-hmm. And any of us who have had long hair, mm-hmm. we know hair, I, not even with the hat, anything, hoodies, the mm-hmm. first thing you do, it's just pull your natural. Hair out. You pull your hair out. Yeah. And she had her hair still in the rope. Mm-hmm. And under the t-shirt. And, under, and I don't think. She had yeah, a t-shirt just, wrapped around her neck three times and then stuffed in her mouth. Mouth. And then, yeah, it's just, yeah. So there, I'm, there's a lot. There I'm a little surprised. There's too. a lot, a lot going on. Yeah. And I, I completely understand how her family has come to this conclusion. Yeah. I'd have questions too. So according to Mary, Rebecca never once said that she felt guilty or blamed herself for anything. The two sisters were very close, and Mary feels like if Rebecca was having any such thoughts, that she would have told her. She heard a loud noise and she came out of the bathroom to check what that noise was. Becky found Max on the floor. She told me that he was unconscious and she did CPR. She felt horrible. She said it was something that she couldn't have prevented, but she did not feel guilty about it. My sister was upset like any adult would be, you know, if there was a child injured. She was upset about it, but not upset to kill herself. Mary said that the people responsible for bringing up the fact that it was probably a suicide were Jonah and the police, but they had no proof at all. When Mary asked them what made them think that something like that would happen, they all kept going back to the voicemail that Jonah had left, Rebecca telling her about Max. But the thing is, nobody besides Rebecca has heard this message, so no one really knows what it said. So there's... There was a voicemail that was left by Jonah on Rebecca's phone, but nobody has ever heard that message. Nobody they knows. They would never be able to pull no, the message. They were not able to do so it. So they don't know really so what the message said. So nobody knows what was said on there except for what Jonah said that he, he said. left. Yeah. So nobody really knows what that message, you know, they, they don't know. And so, and I, you know, I guess we can just leave it at that because we don't know. (coughs) Yeah. And the funny part is it was the only people that came up with that theory was Jonah Shacknai and uh, the sheriff's department. They all came to that conclusion that she was upset enough to kill herself, but they had no proof. Nobody could show me. And I, I even asked, I said, what makes you think that she was so upset that she would kill herself? What do you have? And the only thing that they could say was that Jonah Shack and I called her 1250-ish in, in the middle of the night and left the message. The message that not a single person have heard. And nobody knows what that message says. And remember at this time, though, Max is still alive. Yes. Max is still alive at this point. Um, it was also said that Jonah and Max's mom, Dina, did not blame Rebecca for the accident. And they were very grateful that she acted so quickly. After the accident, Jonah told Dina, you should get down on your knees and thank Rebecca for saving Max's life. At this point, because they thought Max hadn't pulled through. Because, well, and she was performing CPR. CPR. Yeah. You know, so she was, she's trying. And, and I can't imagine being in that state of panic. You know, you go step into the restroom for what you think is going to be a quick second and you come out and that's all it takes. Like you turn your head for one second and you know, so that much damage done from a second story. Mm -hmm. I mean, kids jump, they, you know, like I just, he had to have landed just right for all that damage. You know what I mean? I just feel like, yeah. And I, I don't know. And we'll go into, you know, different theories that people have and, and stuff. Cause there's, there's so much information on this case out there, and there's so many people that have tried to um, kind of decipher it. <laughs> yeah, because it's just there's so much stuff. There's yeah. so many what ifs, I think. Um, 
So inside the bedroom where Rebecca was, police found a cryptic message written on the door. And and it was written in black paint. And it said, she saved him. Can you save her? And that was written on the bedroom door. Um, and the height that this was written would have been like somebody taller than Rebecca. And... Um, This message along with a footprint on the balcony were the only two clues left behind by Rebecca. And this is at the time that he, he, Max, is still alive. Correct. So it makes sense like she saved him. Now can you say, okay. So if Rebecca wrote this, why was she referring to herself herself in a third person? Yeah. So. That's right there. I mean, I, I don't know. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. It, it's, you can go back and forth on this case. I think in so many different ways it's it it can be very confusing um rebecca's hands had the traces of black paint on them and her fingerprints were on the paint tube but that doesn't mean that she wrote it that doesn't mean that she picked up the paint tube yeah and and i was watching a documentary on it and it was talking about how the black paint on her hands wasn't enough For the amount of transfer that it went Mm -hmm. on the ropes and everything that it touched, it did not match the amount of transfer. Mm -hmm. So she did have black paint, but it wasn't Mm -mm. a lot to do all the transfer that she had. Right. And so it seems like it was almost like set up there to make it look like she. Right. Like she did it. Like she did it Like she wrote it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Her family does not believe that Rebecca wrote this. They do, however, think that this message says a lot about her death. They don't, they don't know where the rope came from that Rebecca was found hanging with. There were also two knives found in the room. One knife had Rebecca's fingerprints on it, and the other one was wiped clean. There are some reasons why her family thinks that this was a staged homicide. An attorney hired by the family says that all signs point to foul play. Police and investigators still believe that this was a suicide and said that they have no persons of interest. Um... So it's just, I think there's so much to it that we could probably do like a six hour podcast on this because the, the shows and stuff, um, that are done on this are like six, seven, eight episodes. They're hours long. I tried watching one where, I mean, they literally one whole segment was just based off taking a dummy that was weighted and doing the, um, there's been so many recreations, reenactments of all of this. Um, because like I said, her family has devoted their life to, you know, getting answers because they just they are just not they are not ever going to believe that this was a suicide yeah at all so i don't blame them yeah um so after uh so max passes away unfortunately and after his death dina started to suspect that his fall might not have been an accident so she said that max was by no means a daredevil and he wouldn't have been riding his scooter around the landing She also said that at one point, a doctor at the hospital said that he may have been suffocated. So I'm not sure that that was quickly brought up and then quickly dropped. I don't know how that was brought up or why it was brought up. Yeah. Um, But it was never mentioned again. So I thought that was really odd. Um, In In grief, (sighs) you're trying to grab it, like trying to make sense of everything. But she said that a doctor told her that. Yeah, I don't so know. I'm not sure I'm because I feel like notes. I know that there were a lot of because the spinal cord injury had an effect on his heart. Yes. And so I know that there were a lot of um, there were a lot of things being said about was he born with the heart ailment? Was there something like predisposed? Like there was just there was a lot of. It, w- it was it seemed like it was very complicated that there was so much to it above and beyond just him falling. Yeah. And there weren't a lot of answers, which 
as a parent, I can't even imagine. Yeah. <laughs> um, in 2012, Dina asked for her son's death to be reinvestigated. The forensic pathologist that she hired said that a more reasonable scenario would be that Max was assaulted by another person in the hallway near the banister on the second floor. According to Rebecca, right before Max lost consciousness, he said his dog's name, Ocean. The forensic pathologist said that based on his injuries, this would have been this would not have been possible. With all that being said, Dina has never come out and accused Rebecca of killing Max and that his cause of death still remains an accident. So again, you know, Rebecca's not here anymore. Yeah. Can't ask her. She, you know, she said at the scene of the accident that he was still conscious when she was there and that's what he said. So, you know, she's thinking that he tripped on his dog and that's what he was trying to say when why he was saying the dog's name is that maybe he tripped on the dog or something happened with the dog and that he was the reason that the re- that was the reason that he fell over the banister well she didn't wait to call 911 she didn't wait to start resuscitating no. him there was no hesitation no um her sister came out right away mm-hmm I mean, her sister's a a really great witness as far as what happened afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's also, it's all just, it's kind of like something you hear about in the movies that you never really think would happen in real life. And I know her sister got put on a plane the very next day, sent back home. Um, Yes. So, and so as this is happening, like prior to, um, Prior to Max passing away, um, the her Jonah and and Dina were obviously by Max's bedside, but their families had started to fly in from different parts um, of the United States to obviously be with them. Um, Dina has a twin sister named Nina, <laughs> um, and she flew in from San Francisco with her teenage son, and then Jonah's younger brother Adam Shacknai flew in from his home in Tennessee and would be staying in the mansion's guest house. So Adam was the last known person to see Rebecca alive. So within 24 hours of Adam's arrival, Rebecca would be dead. So this all is happening in like such a short, short period of time. And I understand why the sister did not stay there. Because I have to say, when you witness something very traumatic, the first thing you want to do is go home. Regardless, I don't know how long her sp- stay was originally planned Rebecca's for. Rebecca's sister? Her sister, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know how long her she was originally supposed to stay, but I do know that when I was younger, my mom um, got hit by a bike mm-hmm. on the beach strand um, her and my brother, and they got all scratched up. My mom got all this, you know, damage to her face, trauma, everything. Um, I think, I believe she was on roller skates. She got hit by a bike. She fell on the pavement. My first thought, because at the time I was living with my grandma, send me home. I was supposed to stay there the whole entire weekend. I just wanted to go home. Yeah. Like, I I don't blame her, you know, yeah. I wanted to send her sister back, not being there and stuff. But it's very traumatizing yeah. Oh, definitely. And then her like sister that. was 13 years old. Yeah. <laughs> so she was, <laughs> she's a child herself. Of course. So yeah, it's, it's so sad. Yeah. So the, br- so the brother staying in the guest house on the property. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Adam Shacknai is Jonah's, Jonah's brother. And he was 48 years old at the time of the accident and was nothing like his brother, Jonah. They always got along as brothers, but they were said to just be cut from different cloths. Uh, While Jonah was married twice, became a highly successful businessman and very wealthy, Adam lived a simpler life. Although he graduated from the University of Memphis with a degree in American literature, he chose a life on the water. He became a deckhand on tugboats and then a tugboat operator. He had been doing this for 28 years, living part-time on a boat and part-time in his apartment in Memphis. He was in a 20-year relationship um with a woman named mary and they kept their relationship very private and chose to never marry and um you don't hear about tugboat operators as being a Mm -mm. career no you know no i thought that was very interesting and that will also come into play too Oh, okay so um they just both lived very different lives but they still but they were very close as brothers 
So Rebecca's family thinks that Adam is the one that might be responsible for Rebecca's death. Um, maybe this was all done over Max's accident, or maybe he was jealous of his older brother's money and him having a younger girlfriend. I feel like her family, um, which obviously I'm sure if anybody was put in that position, was just grasping at straws. They wanted answers, and the fact that her death was ruled a suicide I think so fast, so quickly. Um, I felt like they felt so helpless that they were just coming up with all of these theories and all of these possibilities and these what ifs in their head. And they just were like, this happened, that happened. No, this, no, it was that, no, it was this. And they just had all these stories. um, And they, I feel like every single story <clears throat> that they came up with, they felt so passionate about. And I also think like it didn't help with the reenactments and the recreation of the crime scene because that only brought in more questions because yeah. more questions came up based on what they saw at the crime scene and based on um, how they found her. It just, every time they did a reenactment, it just brought up more questions as opposed to providing answers mm-hmm. for the family to be satisfied with. Yeah, no, Definitely. Absolutely. Um, So Adam found out about Max's accident from his father. And that's exactly what he referred to it as was an accident. He said that he never heard his father sound more devastated. After finding out about this, Adam called Rebecca, not Jonah. So they're saying that that's a little odd because Adam and Rebecca didn't have a relationship a relationship really you know they didn't really know each other because adam lived yeah. in tennessee yeah. and rebecca lived at the mansion but maybe he wanted to hear what happened from her mouth? from her yeah, yeah. I, I, don't I don't know, know. um this is just these are just things that her family is saying that they feel are a little bit odd yeah um that took place so he asked if she thought that he should fly into town And Rebecca told him to follow his heart. So he booked a ticket and he headed to California. Some people found it odd that Adam called Rebecca and not Jonah because it was said that they didn't know each other very well. While Jonah was by Max's side, Rebecca picked up Adam from the airport. Their first stop was the hospital. Then Jonah, Rebecca, Adam, and another friend went to dinner at a restaurant called the Fish Market. Adam said that it was a very awkward evening and he felt bad for Rebecca. She was very quiet most of the evening and barely touched her food. I can't even believe that they even went out to dinner. I know. I just find that whole scenario weird. Uh Yeah. Yeah. I just, I I couldn't imagine being the father of a son who's in the hospital. I would not be out to dinner with friends. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not here to judge. I'm like, I'm really not. But I just find that all really odd. Yeah, no. it, it is. I mean. But at that point, they thought again, Max yes, was going to make it. Exactly. And I think that um, when he passed, it was quickly. Yeah. I think that maybe there were signs of improvement. And then it just kind of went, went the other way. Yeah. So after dinner, they went their separate ways. And that would be the last time that Jonah would see Rebecca alive. Jonah went back to the hospital and Adam and Rebecca went back to the Spreckles mansion. So they were the only two people that were there on the property the whole night. Rebecca's sister, Zena, had already flown back to Missouri. Their dog, Ocean, had been kenneled, so there was nobody there but the two of them at the mansion. Adam said that the last time he saw Rebecca alive was around 8 p.m. After they got back from dinner, he said that he went to the guest house, and he told Rebecca if she needed anything to come and find him. He said that the next time he saw her is when he found her dead body hanging from the mansion's bedroom window. Um, the guest house that he was staying in was quite a ways from the mansion and even had a separate address like we mentioned in the beginning. Um, with the mansion having 26, 27 rooms, 10 of them being bedrooms, um, her family is saying, why did Adam choose to stay all the way in the guest house? If that mansion was so big, why did he choose to be so far away? Um, police said that because Adam was staying in the guest house that he technically wasn't in the mansion when Rebecca died um, and he wouldn't have been able to hear anything going on inside because he was too far away. I feel like if you were at the other end of that mansion, you wouldn't hear anything 
Yeah. You could be in the same house and still not hear anything. Yeah, it's so, so huge. Um, so Adam said that once he got to the guest house, he called his girlfriend. He took um, he took an Ambien, a sleeping pill, and he went to bed. And this was all around 8 o'clock. The next few hours will still remain a mystery to Rebecca's family. Either one of two things happened. Either Rebecca launched a bizarre suicide plot while Adam was sleeping in the guest house or someone came in and attacked her. Yeah. And it makes me, you can even say, like, if it wasn't Adam, someone else, like, you know, you don't know. Yeah, you don't. And that's the real shitty part. Yeah. <laughs> um, Her family believes that something horrifying happened to Rebecca between the time she left dinner and that her body was found. Uh, Rebecca's sister Mary said, I truly believe that my sister died because Max got injured and somebody held her responsible for Max's injury and decided to execute her. As soon as I found out that she was naked and bound, it confirmed my fear that she did not commit suicide. She was murdered. Yeah. So that is that her sister. um, There's there's many, many, many interviews out there with her sister and her sister. It's just heartbreaking to listen to her sister talk about her because they were so, so close. But she is so hell bent on the fact that her sister did not commit suicide. Like I wouldn't, they were so, she says that just, just religion in general, like they were so religious and this went against everything that they believed in. Um, and they just, they don't believe that that would ever have been anything that she would have done to, you do not need to take off all your clothes to, yeah i just don't picture a woman doing that no and i mean statistics will show you that you know and you can't look at statistics for everything i understand that however in this case like i think looking back at you know different cases like there are very few cases of women hanging themselves yeah it's just um i i don't a chosen form of suicide by women and, yeah. you know, it is. It's a vanity thing. Yeah. It, it definitely is. Um, so at 6.48 a.m., Adam made the 911 call to report that he had found Rebecca's body. Adam claims that he woke up, took a shower, and then decided to walk to a coffee shop. He testified that as he walked towards the mansion, he spotted something out of the corner of his eye. He realized it was Rebecca's body hanging from a red water skiing tow rope. Um, And she was hanging from the balcony. Adam testified that when he saw her body, he had a feeling it was too late and that Rebecca was already dead. In the 911 call, Adam struggles to tell the operator where he's at. um, And he doesn't know the address of the mansion. You can hear Adam tell the operator that it was the same address where Max's accident happened. But he kept saying, um, he says in he says in the in the recording, he says, um, this is the same place where you picked up the boy the little boy yesterday. But at this point it wasn't yesterday, it was two, two days, days prior. Um, so they don't know if maybe that's why they couldn't find the call. And who knows if they were actually looking for the call. They just kept asking him like we need the address. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't know that it was a well-known, like, historical address. Um, and just saying the Sparkles Mansion, they would know where to go to. Yeah, I don't know. Even though San Diego's huge, Coronado's not huge. It's not. And, they were, and he, you know, he, he says, like, across from the hotel. So he's trying to direct them there. And you can hear him. He's so out of breath. He's running all around. Um, he's, he's doing a lot of things. And, this is, and it's all very evident like on the it's on the call like it's a very long 911 call um so um you also hear him that he's out of breath and he's running to check the front of the house for the address so he runs into the kitchen he gets a knife he drags a broken table over to the window where rebecca was hanging and he stood on top of it he was holding her body up with one hand and then he used the other hand to cut the rope to get her down and you can hear this is all happening on the recording you hear all of this happening and he's hanging it she's hanging off the balcony on the outside of the house so he's dragging the table on the outside of the house and it's a broke and it's a broken table it only has three legs oh wow so um 
I think at that point, like, again, there's, there's so much, like a lot of things can point to him, but again, you know, I, but I, I don't know like if he's he, really trying. I'm like, but also again, on the other side, if it was staged, he knows that she's dead already. Yeah. So he can put a show on and, re- you know, I don't know because in the beginning of the 911 call, I'll, we'll put the 911 call in here so you guys can okay. hear it. But the first thing that he says when the operator answers the phone is he says, yeah, I got a girl here and she hung herself. He, he didn't refer to her by name. By name. Yeah. My brother's. I'm, I'm at my brother's house. Yes. I'm like, it, it's just, I don't know. There's just something very cold, <sighs> cold and odd about yeah. almost like he was trying to say the right thing. But he got got nervous and did I don't know. It's very odd to me. Um, the whole call is 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 weird. But again, like you you hear the panic in his voice, and at one point he's screaming at her, "Are you alive? Are you alive?" So yeah. Emergency, what are you reporting? Yeah, uh, I, I got a girl hung herself in the guest house of, uh, it's on Ocean Boulevard across from the hotel, same place that you came and got the cake yesterday. Okay, sir, so what is the address? I'm not sure, uh, 19, I'm in mean, the back house, is 1928 something. Uh, I'm not sure. Let me call you back. Okay, sir, is she yeah. still alive? I don't know. Okay. Uh, Fire medical emergency. Coronado with 
transfer. Go ahead, sir. Okay. I was now, let me just call myself. What's the address? 1043 Ocean Boulevard. 1043 Ocean Boulevard? Yeah. Okay, what's wrong? She hung herself, man. I woke up. Okay, is it the house? It's a house. Okay, how old is she? I think about 30. 30, okay. When was the last time you saw her? Last night. Okay, is she beyond help? I'm drunk, give me some. I'm doing, I'm compressing her chest right now. I'm, okay, hold on. What's, 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 what's your name? Adam Shackner. Okay, I have help on the way. What's your cell phone number? Is it 901 485? 901 485. Okay, listen to me. Help is coming right now, okay? And PD, you're on the way? Yes, we are. Okay, and you're right there with her. Did you cut her down? Yes, I did. Okay, just stay with me. When the emergency responders arrived, they pronounced Rebecca dead on the scene. They determined that she had died around 3 a.m. Uh, they, they made that determination based on the condition of her body. Adam is the one who made the call to Jonah to tell him about Rebecca. Jonah and Dina were in the hospital with Max when he got the call. Jonah stepped out of the room to take the call and then came back in and told Dina Rebecca killed herself. When Dina asked Jonah why, like why, he's asking why, why did she kill herself? Yeah, Dina. He made the motion of like stabbing himself in the stomach and he says agent Asian honor. Um, and I think what he meant by that was she killed herself because of what happened to Max. The, the right, that right there is a little odd to me. It's very odd. I mean, I, it's almost like he was like, I don't want to say relieved, but kind of like, okay, this is what she did. My girlfriend, yeah, but you know, I I don't know. I feel like I'd I'd have a bigger reaction. The thing that gets me the most blame her exactly. But the thing that gets me the most, I think, about this whole case is the short amount of time that all this is happening in. This is happening in a a span of Two two days. Yeah, and so again, like. I can't imagine being Jonah either. Like your son, yeah. this is happening to your son and now your girlfriend. Like this is just like. A man with a lot of money has a lot of means. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. Um, I'm just curious to know, and I'm just going to throw this out there. Was he surprised that his brother was coming to visit? Because if we're going to, let's say we rule the brother out as not being it, but maybe hired hitmen or, you know. Like revenge or... But do you do that in two days and your son's not dead yet? I don't know. I mean... Do you act that quickly? It would do... I guess it would depend on... Especially with them saying that like... That at this point when this happened... Well, it was... It happened right after he got the news. Yeah, but you can... Supposedly at 12.50, he got the news. We don't know that. Well, we, we don't. don't know what that message said. Yeah, that's, we don't. That's what he said. But let's just say that it did. Can you get somebody out there that fast? Within a couple hours, somebody's out there. I mean, a man with money has a, is a man yeah. with means. Like, I just, but I, I mean, I'm not saying it was, it, it's just, I feel like. No, just you play through so, all these different scenarios yeah, in your head so of all the what ifs, you know, yeah. just because you wouldn't do that doesn't mean that somebody else wouldn't. Yeah. You know, and I hate to point you, the finger and I don't want to, I don't want to say anything and misspeak, you know, because I feel like if they are completely innocent of this, let's just say it's just so devastating what they went through yeah. in those two days mm-hmm. time. That's a lot of trauma. And you can't even begin to imagine like how they're processing this. And like when people are in a state of shock like this, who knows what they're yeah. thinking or you know i mean you're not in your right mind no absolutely you're not so the coronado police and the san diego county sheriff's department were still at the mansion processing the scene at this point they were treating rebecca's death as a possible homicide they oh, searched so they did initially initially yes okay um they searched the second story bedroom where her body went over the ledge 
they found the other end of the noose that was tied around Rebecca's neck fastened to the bed frame. They found two knives, black paint, two brushes, along with the message that was painted on the door. She saved him. Can you save her? The police questioned Jonah, Adam, Dina, and even Rebecca's ex-husband. Um, they all cooperated with authorities. <clears throat> At the end of the interview, Jonah seemed scared and even asked officers if he needed protection. Um, but again, this could all be an act. Like, you don't yeah. know. You know what I mean? Like, it sounds good. However, yeah, stranger things have happened. Um, I don't know. It's so strange, but it seems like it's so quick and on their feet that it might even just be the truth. I mean, but, you know, because... I feel like a lot of times when we cover these cases that it's you see where they're hesitating or they don't uh-huh. have answers or they're struggling or they're and this one just seems like they have the answers. It's uh-huh. really super quick. It's oh, yeah. It's smooth. It's fast. It's quick. There's no questions. You know, it's just so. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, it's very, very interesting. Yeah. Um, the only person who was questioned that didn't have an alibi was Adam. Um, Rebecca's family said that the police started to make some serious mistakes at this point. Rebecca's body was left outside in the hot sun for hours. Um, a local news helicopter caught an aerial view of her body laying under a blanket on the front lawn of the mansion. The family says that police also dismissed two crucial clues. The neighbor said that there was a party and loud music coming from the mansion that night. There was actually supposed to be a get-together there that night. However, with all of the events that had taken place, would Rebecca still have kept those plans? Uh, I doubt it. Yeah. Was the music playing because of the, to cover up the screams? Yes. I I did find that part weird when I did hear about the music being blasting from the mansion. And as neighbors, too, knowing all this had happened two days prior or the day prior with six-year-old max like Mm -hmm. are you really throwing a party yeah yeah uh rebecca's family is adamant that there was not a party at the mansion that night this case has been highly televised and in newspapers everywhere and not one person has ever come forward saying that they were there at a party or no one has been seen there at a party so i think that 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 is one thing i think that is pretty solid in this case is that the if somebody, somebody would have come forward by now. Somebody would have been like, either I was there, I know somebody was there. Yes. Pictures would have surfaced. Something would have come up. Yeah. There's there was literally no nothing. And the brother doesn't even mention a party. He said, I took a no. nappy and I went to bed. I like went he to bed. Would have, he would have mentioned yes. there were people starting to that, arrive. That he would have heard. Playing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one neighbor that lives two doors down said that around 11 p.m. she heard a scream for help. She testified that she believed it was coming from the front of the Spreckles mansion. But if she heard it, why did she do nothing about it? Um, so, I don't know. If you hear somebody screaming, what do you do? Do you yeah. go outside? Do you look? Do you call for help? Do you call 911? What do you do? I, I do have to say that I have been in that situation where one time I was laying in bed and I heard one like, help, like that. And then it just, and I, I kind of sat up in my bed. This one, I lived at our old address and, you know, the streets are crowded. You know, I lived on a main street and I kind of sat up in bed to listen to see if I can hear it again. And I didn't do anything because I only heard it one time, didn't know where I was coming from. What would I tell the 911? Exactly. Somewhere in my neighborhood, somebody yelled the yeah. word help. Yeah, that's what I'm I saying. Have, like- I have nowhere to send you to. So, and I just figured, well, if it happens again, maybe I'll get up, go outside. Or if it happens again, or if somebody who was closer Mm -hmm. or did hear it as well, maybe they would call. Like, I just, I didn't know what to do with that one help that I heard. Mm -hmm. So I can see being in a position where you're not calling 911 for the one time you hear something. And again, I think this is her family just grasping at anything that they get, you know, because they want, they want answers. So two days after Rebecca's death, Adam Shacknight was given a polygraph test that consisted of 10 yes-no questions. Adam was asked, did you do anything to Rebecca that would have resulted in her death? And were you in the bedroom where Rebecca was found hanging at any time during the night? 
Adam replied no to both of those questions. The examiner found the results inconclusive, but said that he felt Adam was telling the truth. He was cleared and headed back home to Tennessee. I don't know how I feel about this test because, number one, they're not admissible in court. So why do we even do these damn things? Yeah. But as the examiner, I don't give a shit what you feel. Yeah. Well, um, you, and- your feelings shouldn't matter in any of this. Yeah. You shouldn't have any feelings. It should be... Yes, yes or, or no. no. Did yeah, and um I feel like if me, I feel like I would feel those things like crazy because my brain goes in a million directions at one time. You know yeah. that I have this attention deficit issue and I feel like I'd be thinking about a hundred million things and I'd be questioning myself under certain circumstances. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I just always feel like, you know, yeah. I, I think about no, the it would be hard. Ifs. I mean, yeah. you're automatically nervous regardless of yeah. anything. Like anybody's going to be nervous whether you did something or not. You start yeah. hooking people up to machines and like asking, asking you questions, questions about killing people. Like, come yeah. on, you know, I mean, let's just be honest about it. But I do feel like I don't think that that examiner was the most reputable like yeah. they could have maybe got somebody else that yeah. was a little better we'll say that <laughs> um so on july 16th four days after rebecca died max shackney would would also die so mm-hmm. seven weeks later during a news conference it was announced that rebecca's death had been ruled a suicide and max's death was ruled an accident so that's not a very long time. No. Um, Do you think maybe, and this is just me asking, and I know you don't have to have an answer for it or anything, but I'm just like brainstorming. Do you think maybe because of the death of the son, they m- maybe thought, you know what, let's just sweep this under the rug. It's you know, kind of turning a blind eye kind Who, of thing. The authorities? Maybe. I don't want to like, yeah, but, you know, kind of like, an eye for an eye kind of situation thought process. Behind My mind it. goes to money. My mind yeah. goes to Jonah has a lot of money. Does he does very reputable in this area. I mean, no, I'm not going to say all. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say all police departments <laughs> are shady, but and corrupt however it doesn't take all just take some one. Of, some of them have been known to do some some shady business yeah and this dude's a billionaire yeah i don't know just sweep it under the rug yeah i don't know i yeah it, it, you're it, it I, I don't know there like i said there's so many different ways that this case could go and i think that that is what draws me to it is it's like what (laughs) there's there's so many different outcomes and to me it is it's still a mystery of what happened and it will always be a mystery yeah because the two people that know what happened are no longer here it's true both accidents like yeah you know max is no longer here to say what happened to him and neither is rebecca yeah so um we could probably sit here and, and pick this whole thing apart forever you know, yeah. and and that's <clears throat> that's the unfortunate part about stuff like this, too, I think, you know. Um, so investigators went on to explain how Rebecca made a noose. She tied one end of it to the footboard of the bed. She tied her feet together, then slipped the noose around her neck and then bound her hands. Although unusual, it's not unheard of that people committing suicide take measures to ensure that they can't change their mind. This part I understand. I understand the hand part too, but the feet part, like you can't bring your foot up there and change your mind. So I understand. No. Yeah. I, I understand um, the binding of the hands to not change your mind, but the binding of the feet does not make sense to me. I still just go back to, I don't think, even though, like I said, there have been, um, there have been so many reenactments of this case. Um, and they did have somebody that tried to bind themselves like this. And they were able to do it. Yes. Um, 
however i i go back to the 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 footprints that were that were on the balcony and there was one small area of the railing of the balcony that had dust that had been disturbed they said but if you think about it in your head she has her hands bound behind her back. Like, let's just say that she was able to bind her feet together, tie her hands behind her back, wrap a t-shirt around her head three times and stuff it in her mouth. Let's just say that she was able to do that. So your feet are bound. How are you getting to that balcony and up over the balcony and you only have one footprint on that on the, on the floor yeah the, nothing else is disturbed nothing yeah because literally you have to hop over there you have to hop over there your yeah. feet are bound together how is there only one footprint yeah it just doesn't like there's just so many inconsistencies and i just don't none of this makes an ounce of sense and that's why i feel so horribly for the family because I understand why, you know, you would just lay awake at night and be like, no, it has to be this. It has to be this. Like, it doesn't make sense. There's this so many doesn't questions. scream suicide. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't. Um, there were no drugs or alcohol found in Rebecca's system. Um, there was no evidence of a struggle at all. And um, they said that Rebecca was alive when she was thrown over the balcony yeah i was i heard like something like she was 20 minutes hanging there unconscious but right it was a slow suffocation yes did you say suffocation i did you did okay i did (laughs) suffocation okay (laughs) she suffered i I, you know what that was that was my two words put together because she suffered while suffocating suffocating okay did i say it right though the second time (laughs) yeah (laughs) There always has to be one, guys. There's there always one. has to be was one or it wouldn't be an episode. <laughs> um, so three years after, now this is in 2014, um, Rebecca's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit and asked for a jury trial. The family believed that Rebecca's suicide was staged and that Jonah's ex-wife, Max's mother, and her twin sister Nina were involved. However, none of them were ever suspects and none of them were ever charged. Um, The family finally dropped Nina and Dina from the lawsuit, and they issued a public apology after indisputable evidence that Dina was nowhere near the mansion on the night of the accident. They were... They had video recording. Yeah, they had her at At the the hospital. hospital. Where Uh, where obviously (coughs) she was. I mean, next to her, by her son. Um, So they also had a witness that said that they saw a woman at the front on the front porch of the mansion that night. Oh. Um, and the, the neighbor, I believe was the witness. And the neighbor said that it was a female. She had dark hair. She described her to be, um, about 200 pounds, but, Dina is more slender and maybe weighed at the most 140 pounds. However, it ends up that the person on the porch was Dina's sister, Nina. So she did go she there. She did. She said that she went by. She texted. She's actually the last person to text Rebecca. That was the last text message that was in her phone. Um. <clears throat> she said that she texted her and she wanted to talk to her. She had talked to her previously because she had questions about Max's accident. And she said that when she talked to her, she said that Rebecca's story was just, it wasn't very clear to her and she needed clarity on what exactly happened. And so she said that she texted her and asked her, can I come by And can I talk to you? She said that she physically wanted her to show her where Max fell from. Yeah. Um, And Rebecca never answered her. 
And so she said that she went to the house anyway. She rang the doorbell numerous times. She knocked on the door. And what time was nobody that? answered? Um, this was um, I don't know exactly what time this it was. was. Just that it was that evening. Um, and she said nobody answered the door. And so she turned around and she walked back to her sister's house where she was staying and she went to bed. So she admits to being there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but she just said, um, there's interviews with the sisters and, you know, they address all of this stuff. And I truly believe that they are innocent. Yeah. Um, I do believe that they just, they wanted, they wanted answers, they you know? To know what they just wanted to know what happened. Rebecca, what happened? I heard that she was walking up the stairs and he had a cardiac arrest. I said, I, that makes no sense to me. I said, he's six years old. to help you, boy. I don't understand. And she just looked at me and she said, I know. And that was it. And I said, where did he fall from? Did he fall from the first set of stairs, the little landing, the next set of stairs going up, the top landing by the bedrooms? Where did he fall from? She said twice. He fell from the bedroom. He fell from the bedroom. And I looked at her and I said, well, how do you know that? I thought you didn't see him. No answer. I just wanted to see for myself. That's why I went there. I just wanted her to show me how she found him. Because I didn't understand. But I went up to the front door and rang the bell, nothing. Rang the bell a second time, nothing. You know, knocked on the door, like looked through the glass, nothing. Kitchen was dark, everything was up. So I thought, well, that's kind of strange because her car's here, that light's on, that's weird. So then I just thought, maybe she just doesn't want to talk to me. So I turned around and I left right away. And I walked right back to my sister's house, got ready for bed and went to sleep. Yeah. Um, so in 2018, a jury found um, Adam Shackney was responsible for Rebecca's death in the civil suit. It was a nine to three decision. Um, this whole time, Adam Shackney has maintained his innocence and appealed the verdict. His insurance company finally reached a six hundred thousand dollar settlement with the Zahau family. In October of 2011 Rebecca's body was exhumed for a second autopsy um and the forensic pathologist um that performed this was Dr. Cyril Wecht and he's if you watch true crime you know who this guy is like this guy basically does everybody there 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 he's everyone's go-to um but he concluded that he believes that she did not take her own life, that she was manually strangled. Um, death is a homicide. She was manually strangled, and then it was set up to appear to be a suicidal hanging. Nearly seven years after Rebecca Zahau's mysterious death, in which she was found naked and bound at a multi-million dollar historic mansion in Coronado, her family's wrongful death lawsuit continues. If she uh, jumps off the balcony uh, and steps off, then I don't see how she's going to get four bumps. The suit names Adam Shackney, the brother of Rebecca Zahau's then boyfriend Jonah Shackney, as the one responsible for her death. In court Monday, the jury heard testimony from Dr. Cyril Wecht. He was hired by lawyers for the Zahawi family as an expert witness, taxed with performing a second autopsy. On cross-examination, the attorney for Adam Shackney hammered him about changing his opinion about how Zahawi died. In spite of your knowledge about these hemorrhages, you concluded that her cause of death was asphyxiation by hanging. Is that correct? Argumentative and estimated. Zahau's body was found on the grounds of the Spreckles Mansion on July 13, 2011. When police arrived, they found her in the back lawn. Her hands were tied behind her back and her feet were bound. Her body had been cut down by Adam Shackney, who was staying at the home at the time. The defense continued for hours, calling into question the findings of the forensic pathologist as well as his expertise. What is the significance of a subthelial hemorrhage? It represents blunt force trauma, some blow to the hip. Is it your opinion that that is what caused these particular injuries? 
is four separate rows of two ahead, producing four separate discrete subgelial hemorrhages by a blunt force object. Yeah, they were talking about the lig ligature marks and yeah. that it doesn't match up with the rope strangling her. There's so much. There's just... Um, and I know that when they did the reenactments, um, when they when they originally went to the scene, the bed only moved seven inches, but when they actually reenacted, no matter how they put the dummy over through, dropped, the bed is so light. If you see when we put up pictures, it's a one of those light metal white mm -hmm. framed beds that the bed moved like 39 inches, you know, 27 mm -hmm. inches. Um, it never moved only seven inches. And my first thought is who was sitting on the bed mm -hmm. so that the bed wouldn't move mm -hmm. when they threw her body out, because when the bed moved that much, her feet actually touched, touched the ground, the ground of the balcony because yeah. it was only on the second story. So the feet actually touched the ground mm -hmm. when they did these reenactments so I'm wondering who's holding the bed with the noose and the, so all these things are, yeah, no, I, if I was the family, I'd be questioning, all, like I said before, the more they reenacted, the more, the more questions, questions. Mm -hmm. is just, is crazy. Yeah. You could go back and forth, back and forth forever. I think on this case, yeah. um, there were, there were also messages found in um not messages but notes found that she had written in her phone um and a, a couple of them um were sounds like she wasn't having an easy time towards the end of her life um yeah. does it scream i'm gonna kill myself no <laughs> well of course she's probably struggling with what happened uh, yeah you know? i can't even imagine but um, she also had four hemorrhages on her head where she had been hit with something. And so, you know, if she was hanging. What did she hit? What did she hit? I yeah. mean, there are trees. There are, you know, things that she could have, that she could have. And, and the, the pathologist addresses all of this. You know? Yeah. Um, and I think another thing that he was really hung up on too is how did she how did she bind herself this way? <laughs> like Yeah. You know, I um I was reading that just recently in twenty twenty two, um, the family was trying to actually reopen the case again because they wanted um Adam Shack and I to be tried criminally for this, not civilly. Um, but they won't because there has not been any change in evidence. So it would be like trying the same case again. Um, but they, I think their big thing is they want, they want her cause of death changed to either homicide or undetermined. Undetermined. I'm kind of on the fence on that because I'm I'm all about like um, being a hundred percent sure, and not just off circumstantial evidence or what I think. And yeah, a lot points to Adam, but I'm not convinced a hundred percent that it was him, and yeah. I'm not convinced he if it was he did it alone. So that uncertainty, I would not feel comfortable sending somebody to jail with the lack of physical evidence yeah. of who. It could be. Well, I, I definitely don't DNA, think the there's lack no, of DNA. There's no DNA. And and that that's a problem. That right there's a red flag. That's a problem. Yeah, when there's How other do you people have, living in the yeah, house. Yeah, I mean, they have housekeepers. They have the child. They have visitors. They have everybody. The only person's DNA that was found inside that house and in that area was Rebecca Zahau. That is yeah. weird. Yeah. It was wiped clean. And those were, you know, like, yeah. it, hers were the, there was only her fingerprints on those knives like they were yeah. kitchen knives they came from her kitchen i that everybody yeah. else uses and i did um and i and i you might have mentioned it but i did um see somewhere where they thought she was sexually assaulted with one of those knives as well yes because of the blood that was surrounding the knife yes um but then I, they found that she was on her period so, so it you know she it there's there's so many different 
avenues that this case can go down. And there's so much information out there. So that brings me back to another one. Now that you said she was on her period, Mm -hmm. no woman on their period will get naked. Uh, Well, yeah. I mean, already right there, Mm -hmm. already right there. I'm going to say, nope, not getting naked. I would at least have my underwear on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's regardless of who did it. She didn't commit suicide. No, that's it. Yeah. I'm not comfortable on pinpointing one particular person, but there's a lot of questions, but definitely I'm going to go with she did not commit suicide. I'm going to agree with the family on that one. Yeah. So. And, and and I can see why her family is, you know, continuing to try to make sense of all of this because... Is there, do you really get closure after something like this? I don't know. Do you get closure after all of this? Uh, who knows? Yeah. But I think having answers would make it a little easier to deal with to knowing, move on. knowing what happened. Because with again, you know, you can go back to, are we in danger? Yeah. Who did this? You know, because they, they also, you know, they said that she was, Everybody that they talked to and asked, like, describe Rebecca. She, you know, everybody said, oh, she's nice and she's sweet. But everybody said, like, she was so beautiful. Uh, um, she had, like, a lot of, um, she had dealt with, like, stalkers before in her past. She had a lot of men that were, would obsess over her. So she was also known for not locking the door. And because she felt safe, I think, in that neighborhood that she lived in. Yeah. So was somebody stalking her and they followed her and. A lot of questions. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. But um, like I said, this is a case that I have just followed from the beginning. And it is so interesting to me. Um, just what. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know what will ever come of this. I don't, I feel like yeah. this is probably, I don't want to say that the family has given up, but I feel like there's really not much more they can do. Yeah. I think it's going to be one of those where we might not ever get an answer. But yeah. So well, thank you so much yeah. for following us, listening to us, to our Patreons out there. Absolutely. We thank you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so definitely. If you'd like to support us, we're on Patreon at 50 States of Madness, um, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. And if you have any comments on this topic, please. Yeah, I any really would, opinions? I really would yeah. love to hear um, everybody's um, thoughts on this because this one um, I'm really curious about. I'm really yeah. curious because sometimes, you know, you can have... You can be dead set, like I can be like, no, she didn't commit suicide. But then somebody can go down another road that can really make you look at things differently. Yeah, so. help us look at things differently. Yeah, so I'm curious. Yeah. So, thank yeah. you so, so much. Thank you for watching and listening, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye.